So, welcome to Liberal Viewer Sunday Live Clip Roundup. Thanks for joining me. I've got about 15 clips for you on a few different topics for what I think should be a good show tonight. Um, as always, this is my weekly broadcast of the best clips from the Sunday morning news analysis shows from the corporate media here in the United States, along with my commentary between the clips. Uh, this week, I'll just be using clips from the Sunday morning news shows on the regular Big Five outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News. I won't have any of the uh, quasi-news comedy clips because my regular sources like Saturday Night Live and uh, Real Time with Bill Maher are taking a break for the holidays, but there was still some comedy to be found, even if it was uh, bad comedy. As you can see, when CNN's State of the Union did an hour with an all-female panel reviewing this year's top stories, including the comment from Republican strategist Anna Navarro that you can see over in this clip. And they pop down, but we saw the rise voters. of Wiener. We saw the fall of Wiener. Voters. Unintended. Voters. <laughs> oh, wow. 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 Sunday morning. Wow. <laughs> so uh, I guess that wasn't a very good joke, but it was a little odd seeing this uh, all-female panel talking about the problems with men. It was more like The View than CNN, I thought. And anyway, another way I found comedy within the news shows this morning was this funny focus over on Fox News, which for no apparent reason made Obamacare the top story of the program. And uh, you can see that from the first 15 seconds of uh, Fox News Sunday over in this clip. I'm Chris Wallace. Obamacare goes into full effect January 1st. But more problems with the website and enrollment could mean a chaotic beginning to the new year. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I guess uh, the possibility of future problems with Obamacare is what passes for breaking news over on Fox News. And it's almost like every Fox News program is required to spend a certain amount of time criticizing Obamacare. Um, Anyway, I, I didn't think uh, this Fox News program broke a lot in uh, broke a lot of new ground on in their whole Obamacare discussion. Though there was this discussion that they had between uh, Democratic former Governor Howard Dean and Scott Gottlieb, who's from the Conservative American Enterprise Institute, and I thought um, Howard Dean made an interesting point I hadn't heard before about Republicans complaining about insurance plans with high deductibles and. I'm going to show you that point here. The interesting thing I find about the deductible argument, the deductible argument is such a classic Republican argument. This is what Republicans have always wanted. Have patients put more skin in the game and they'll be more careful about what they spend. And now we have the spectacle of Republicans attacking the high deductibles just because they're so desperate to attack this plan on right. any number. This is a Republican idea. Have higher deductibles. Patients put more skin in the game with their own money, and they're more careful, careful about how, they're, how they Dr. spend Gottlieb, their money. But these aren't really high deductible plans. The idea of a high deductible plan is a lot of the routine stuff you pay for out of pocket, but you're covered on the catastrophic stuff. Here, what's happening is a lot of the routine stuff is paid for in full because of the mandates. Where the deductibles and the copays are going to hit you is on the more important stuff. I mean, you'll get free surgical sterilization if you're a woman, but you might not get cancer therapy paid for, first dollar coverage on that. I mean, that's the problem with these plans. They're not truly high deductible plans in the traditional sense of how we think about them. But now, that argument from Scott Gottlieb there criticizing high deductibles because they don't apply to preventative care is pretty stupid because, well, making people pay any deductible is, on uh, preventative care is stupid, um, at least from a cost-saving perspective, because preventative care is, uh, by definition, almost uh, supposed to be money-saving care. And certainly that uh, sterilization procedure you mentioned, I mean, that's a big money saver, both in terms of pregnancy costs and contraception costs. And I think Howard Dean was definitely right there that this uh, that higher deductibles are a Republican idea that Republicans are complaining about now because it's supposed to, like you said, give patients more skin in the game. And that was kind of the old Republican plan was what it were called medical savings accounts where you're supposed to give people uh, tax deductions for saving money to pay for their own medical care that and because they paid for it they were gonna uh, control costs in their own spending um, but I thought the uh, the big punchline to the Fox News Sunday uh, making Obamacare their top story of the program was the way Chris Wallace transitioned from the the next newsmaker segment over to the panel discussion uh, and I'll show you that over 
in this clip. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Chris. Up next, our Sunday panel joins the discussion as the president tries to change the focus from Obamacare to extending unemployment benefits and raising the minimum wage. Plus. So, yeah, I guess it was President Obama who was changing the focus from Obamacare to these unimportant things like the 1.3 million people losing their uh, long term unemployment benefits uh, this last week or uh, raising the minimum wage, which, ha which hasn't been raised in a really long time. And those are both topics I covered on my Liberal Viewer Sunday live clip roundup uh, last Sunday. So you can go back and watch that if you're interested in that. But uh, if there was anything that actually did approach breaking news uh, this Sunday, I mean, it, it's kind of an old news story. It was uh, on uh, Benghazi. Uh, the New York Times put out an article, and I'll, uh, I... I think uh, down yeah in the video description below where I'm speaking, I, I put a link to the article, and uh, here's kind of a, a screenshot of uh, what you see if you go to that link. It's called A Deadly Mix in Benghazi uh, by David Kirkpatrick, who uh, did a lot of research, interviewed a lot of people in Benghazi, uh, and he came up with uh, some interesting conclusions that kind of uh, contradict a lot of the Republican talking points. Uh, First, I'll show you uh, I, one thing I thought was funny was the way uh, David uh, Gregory over on NBC's Meet the Press introduced the topic, uh, although I was glad to see Meet the Press actually had David Kirkpatrick on, the, the author, uh, and I'll show some clips from him. But here, first, here's how uh, David Gregory, he, at the, you'll see at the very end, he kind of like misspeaks in the way he introduces the topic on Meet the Press uh, over in this clip. Times report concludes there was no involvement by al-Qaeda in the attack that killed four Americans, including U.S. Ambassador Christopher Stevens. The Times also says in a piece out this morning that the attack was in part fueled by anger over an American-made video critical of Islam. So does this bolster the Obama administration's initial response to the attack and undermine its critic? Does it bolster the Obama administration and undermine its critic? I, that the misspeaking I was talking about is he said his uh, undermine its critic. I don't know. Is that sort of a, an oblique reference to Fox News, which has been the main critic of the Obama administration on Benghazi? Though I guess there were uh, several Republicans who were also critical. So anyway, um, uh, I did want to show uh, David Kirkpatrick, the author of this. Uh, Benghazi story in the New York Times talking about his findings. Uh, the two big findings were that uh, Al Qaeda wasn't really involved. Uh, I mean, there was the most tenuous of connections between the groups involved and the core Al Qaeda. And then the other big conclusion that contradicts the Republican talking points is that this uh, anti Islam video was a factor in sparking the attack. Uh, so, but first I'll show. Um, that uh, this is uh, how uh, David Kirkpatrick, from who wrote this New York Times article, uh, how he describes the very tenuous, if non-existent, connection between the people who did the attack in Benghazi and Al-Qaeda uh, over in this clip. Times report concludes there was no involvement by Al-Qaeda in the attack that killed four Americans, including U.S. Ambassador Christopher Stevens. Oh. Excuse me, that was the clip that I just played. Here, here's the clip of David uh, Kirkpatrick uh, explaining the lack of connection between Al-Qaeda and the attack in Benghazi, sorry, in this clip. Thing. Uh, uh, I've talked to uh, some of the people who I believe were lead perpetrators, and it, it's, just, it's just obvious from them and the people around them, they're, they're purely local people. Their, their pasts are known, their records are known, when they were in prison, who they hung out with in prison, who their associations are. There's just no chance that this was an Al-Qaeda attack if, by Al-Qaeda, you mean the organization founded by Osama bin Laden. Now, uh, I've tried to understand uh, some of the statements coming out of the United States Congress blaming Al-Qaeda for this, and the only way that they make sense to me is if you're using the term Al-Qaeda a little differently. If you're using the term Al-Qaeda to describe uh, even a local group of Islamist militants who may uh, dislike democracy or have a grudge against the United States, if you're going to call anybody like that Al-Qaeda, then okay, uh, certainly there were some anti-Western Islamist militants involved in this attack. Uh, uh, but to me, that's a, that's a semantic difference and not a, a, a useful way of uh, answering the original question, which is, right. did the group uh, founded by Osama bin Laden and led by Ayman Zawahiri uh, lead this attack? So let me 
So yeah, that is uh, an important distinction, I think, there uh, between, and I'm going to show Daryl Issa, the Republic, one of the Republicans who made a big deal about uh, the whole Benghazi thing. He was also on, um, uh, was he on Meet the Press or Face the Nation? Anyway, he was also, yeah, he was uh, uh, also on Meet the Press, and he responded uh, to this report a little later, and I'll show that clip in a minute, um, and uh, his attempt to sort of backtrack while pretending he wasn't backtracking is kind of funny. But uh, before I get to that, I also want to show uh, another clip of David Kirkpatrick. This is where he's talking about uh, whether what um, Susan Rice said on those Sunday morning talk shows. You know, Susan Rice was ambassador to the UN at the time. They, some people say she didn't become Secretary of State because of uh, the way she was tied to this whole Benghazi Republican Fox News generated scandal and anyway here is uh, how David Kirkpatrick he actually did not completely exonerate Susan Rice or um, but he said that she misled people in a different way than the Republicans seem to think and anyway here is uh, you can see that in this clip I would say no we're not bolstering that original assessment in fact uh, she made some clear misstatements there this was not a street protest uh, and it was not a copycat of what happened in Cairo that was a, an unarmed street <laughs> protest this is a group of armed men who inspired by a video deliberately attacked the compound and so what she's doing uh, up it, what she's doing there through her misstatement is actually setting up a kind of a false dichotomy either it was a spontaneous street protest or it was an armed terrorist attack and not, neither of those turns out to be exactly the case it was an armed terrorist attack motivated in large part by the video but that's the point yeah so uh, the, and that's the second big republican talking point uh that uh david kirkpatrick debunks there um where excuse me he's uh says you know republicans have been saying that uh the Obama administration lied by saying this thing was the result of a video when there was no uh, motivation from this anti-Islam video at all. And uh, what David Kirkpatrick is saying and what his research showed is that some people were in fact motivated by the video, um, even though he doesn't line up with everything that uh, Susan Rice said on those five Sunday morning shows that she went on uh, uh, back a couple weeks after the attack. Um, and then uh, the final thing I want to show is that uh, David Kirkpatrick wasn't, he wasn't like completely exonerating the Obama administration or the, the problems in Benghazi. He said there were definitely security failures and there were also uh, intelligence failures. Um, but uh, it just doesn't fit with the Republican talking points. And I'll show you that clip here. Yeah, I would say in addition to inadequate security, th there was a real intelligence failure here. You know, there's a, there's a substantial CIA operation uh, tasked with trying to figure out what are the threats to American interests among these militias. And it's clear that the United States fundamentally understood the dynamics of those militias. The people who attacked the compound were members of the militias the U.S. expected to help protect the same mission. All right, David. So yeah, I thought that whole uh, David Kirkpatrick interview was very interesting and, you know, especially because this Benghazi thing has been going on since, you know, September 11th, uh, 2012, before the presidential election and Fox News and the right wing blew it up into this whole partisan issue. And uh, I mean, I always have thought that there were, you know, probably some problems with the security and the intelligence, you know, what uh, David Kirkpatrick just said there. But the, the whole idea that there was a cover up and that there were lies and uh, there was this big, you know, conspiracy, I never really bought it. And I, I think this undermines it even further. But um, one of the uh, main purveyors of that conspiracy theory was Republican Congressman Daryl Issa from California, uh, my state. And uh, he was confronted with uh, what he said uh, about Benghazi uh, uh, several months ago or uh, a little more than that. And, uh, he kind of backtracked, but tried to look like he wasn't backtracking, and I, I want to show you that clip here. Title to the facts. The American people were effectively lied to for a period of about a month. Oh, that I'm sorry. I, I, when I introduce that, I have to say the beginning of this clip is back from May uh, when uh, 
this is uh, David Gregory is confronting Daryl Issa with what he said in May 2013, and then you can see Daryl Issa's response. And, and anyway, that's this clip. Title to the facts: the American people were effectively lied to for a period of about a month. That's important to get right. Sure and just want to be clear: what you believe the lie was. This was a terrorist attack from the get-go. It was never about a video. Do you, have you changed your mind based on the New York Times investigation? Were you wrong about that? Well, the New York Times, quite frankly, David did some very good, David Kirkpatrick did some very good work, but interviewing people in Benghazi after the fact, after the world has been told about this video, is really not real time. So we have seen no evidence that the video was widely seen in Benghazi, a very isolated area, uh, or that it was a leading cause. What we do know is September 11th is not an accident. These are terrorist groups, some of them linked to or self-effacing or self-claimed as Al-Qaeda linked. But I think David made, a, and I, before I go on, I wanted to make a very good point that David put out. Look, it is not about Al-Qaeda as the only terrorist organization, any more than Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Hamas or Hezbollah. But They're you, all... no, no, but you. <laughs> so, yeah, he kind of backtracks on two things there. First, he, he's saying that they... They're linked to Al Qaeda, or they they may have some claim to you know aspirationally be part of Al Qaeda, which is that's a pretty tenuous link. And then, of course, for all those months, I heard the video had nothing to do with the attack in Benghazi. And now, uh, if you listen carefully, you heard uh, Congressman Daryl Issa say there it wasn't a leading cause, which is not the, quite the same thing as saying that nobody was motivated by that video and it was an isolated area of course you can see videos on cell phones and of course you can hear about uh, other people you know secondhand apparently there were like sermons all over uh, the region uh, decrying the video so you didn't even necessarily have to see the video so anyway uh, I thought that was kind of amusing seeing uh, Daryl Isa backtrack there and luckily on Meet the Press they also had um, uh, Congressman uh, Joaquin Castro from Texas uh, and he kind of pointed out the silliness of what Daryl Issa had done and especially in light of this new information and I'll show you that clip here. It certainly does David and I hope that Chairman Issa and others have learned a lesson from this. Uh, Chairman Issa and members of that committee crusaded for over a year on what was really a fairy tale uh, claiming that the administration knew that Al-Qaeda was involved and wouldn't admit it. And the fact is that when a tragedy like this happens, whether it's something like this or a mass shooting at a school, there's a lot of information that comes out at the beginning that later has to be verified. But the important thing is that Susan Rice and the administration were trying their best to level with the American people. And, and uh, some of the information that came out early, although it may have been wrong, uh, that was their best effort. Uh, Daryl Issa and others took that and crusaded against the administration uh, in a way that I think has been a big distraction for the American people. Let me ask And yeah, and that is especially what I thought uh, more so than the security lapses and the intelligence failures. From the very beginning, I thought that the any kind of misinformation that was coming out at the beginning had more to do with what they call the fog of war than with any big conspiracy to mislead anyone. Anyway, I mean, you any news event, uh, a lot of the information that comes out at the beginning turns out not to be true. And that, uh, and if you have been paying attention to this scandal for, uh, you know, closely for a while, the, the talking points did go through a lot of revisions in the Obama administration before um, Susan Rice went on all those Sunday talk shows. But the fact that it was inspired by a video, that was in the beginning. Uh, the fact that it was, you know, like a, a spontaneous or like an attack that uh, resulted after some sort of spontaneous demonstration resulting as a result or resulting from anger over this video, that was in all the versions of the talking points. Uh, even so the revisions didn't add that. That was there from the beginning. So I don't see the conspiracy and I think this is just a, another another straw breaking the Benghazi camel's back, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I somehow, if Hillary Clinton runs for president in 2016, I don't think we've heard the last of this. This is, and over on Fox News Sunday, they, uh, I'm not gonna show that clip, but they let um, uh, Mike Rogers, I am gonna show a clip from him, uh, a Republican congressman sort of uh, debunk this whole Benghazi story in the New York Times and they, 
suggested several times that this is a way to like clear the way for Hillary Clinton to run in 2016. That's what was the whole driving force behind this New York Times article, at least according to the people over on Fox News. But uh, the other big topic I want to cover in Benghazi, I'm almost embarrassed I spent that much time on it, um, is uh, NSA spying. There were a couple breaking stories uh, this last week. First, there was another district court ruling. You know, last week on Liberal Viewer Sunday Live Clip Roundup, I was talking about a good ruling from the uh, D.C. Circuit, uh, well, a district, a lower judge, a, a district court judge in the uh, dis, uh, District of Columbia found that it was likely uh, the whole NSA spying, the bulk phone record collection was likely unconstitutional and uh, wrote how it was, you know, nearly Orwellian and uh, it, you know, it was a really good ruling. Well, this last week there was another judge who uh, basically ruled in the opposite direction, and this is in the ACLU versus Clapper case that the ACLU brought. And uh, so, over on um, Meet the Press, uh, I believe it was Meet the Press, right? Yeah, they uh, had um, Ben uh, uh, Wisner on. Wisner, Wisner. Yeah, I don't know him personally, but he is a, an ACLU attorney and also a, um, uh, he's also, excuse me, I'm making sure, yeah. This is over on Meet the Press, I was just double checking that. So Ben Wiesner is uh, an ACLU attorney and he's also, the ACLU is a, a legal advisor for Edward Snowden, so, uh, and I'm gonna show him talking about that in a minute, but uh, first I wanna show uh, Ben Wiesner uh, reacting, or is it Wiesner, reacting to this uh, latest court ruling, uh, David Gregory uh, actually quotes part of the ruling to him, uh, and then you can see how he reacts uh, over in this clip. No doubt the bulk telephony metadata collection program vacuums up information about virtually every telephone call to, from, or within the United States. That is by design as it allows the NSA to detect relationships so attenuated and ephemeral they would otherwise escape notice. As the September 11th attacks demonstrate the cost of missing such a thread can be horrific, the bulk telephony metadata collection program represents the government's counterpunch, connecting fragmented and fleeting communications to reconstruct and eliminate Al-Qaeda's terror network. So here's a district court judge disagreeing with another district court judge. If it's going to go to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals has to do something. Is that where this is headed? Well, it is, but let me just say, this district judge is not just disagreeing with another judge. He's also disagreeing with the president's own hand-picked advisory panel. That panel, which included a former top-level CIA official, uh, a former uh, counterterrorism, counterterrorism advisor, concluded that they had seen no evidence uh, that the bulk telephone metadata program had uh, been uniquely successful, had stopped any kind of attack. So there is a dispute about whether this is is, uh, you know, effective or even legal. But yes, um, I think we always expected that there would be differences of opinion in the lower courts. Uh, there's no question that it's time for the Supreme Court to weigh in uh, and to see whether, as we believe, the NSA allowed its technological capabilities to outpace so democratic control. One of Stone's... Yeah, so uh, I thought that was a, a good response there. And then a, another good response uh, uh, over on Face the Nation, uh, Jesslyn Raddick, who's another legal advisor to Edward Snowden, she also reacted to this latest court ruling. Um, and I want to show you, uh, she was talking to uh, Major Garrett, was in for uh, Bob Schieffer on Face the Nation, and I'll show you that clip here. Willingly. I think it's very different if I choose to give personal data to Facebook to keep my family members up to date than giving personal information to the government, which is backdooring Twitter and Facebook and all of these social media. I think. Uh, Judge Pauly's opinion turns on the idea that if we collect even more data, we're doing less targeting. But that actually inverts the constitutionality of the Fourth Amendment, which requires individualized suspicion and probable cause and targeting in order to surveil someone. Uh so, yeah, I definitely agree with Jessalyn Raddick there that uh, this opinion does sort of turn the Fourth Amendment on its head and uh, uh, the other thing that really disturbs me about it is it gives a lot of uh, new talking points to Republicans who have been saying that it's not unconstitutional. And I, I want to show uh, Representative Mike Rogers, who's this former FBI agent and head of the uh, House Intelligence Committee. He, he uh, was also talking about Edward Snowden, and I'm going to show a couple, uh, I'm going to 
debunk a little what he says about Edward Snowden, but uh, he starts off, um, uh, this is, uh, first Chris Wallace reads some quotes from Edward, Edward Snowden just gave a couple interviews and he uh, made this uh, on Channel 4 in Britain, gave the alternative Christmas message where he said some things about, you know, the loss of privacy. Uh, but anyway, in this recent interview, he kind of dissed some uh, people in Congress, including Representative Mike Rogers, saying that uh, the reason he had to do what he did was because they weren't doing their job. And so uh, Chris Wallace, uh, at least to his credit, uh, reads these quotes to uh, Mike Rogers and lets him react, and then um, which ends up in a big smear on Edward Snowden. Anyway, you can see it in, uh, in this clip. Washington Post interview. Uh Snowden asks and answers the question, who elected him to reveal all of these government secrets? And his answer is that he says that it was the overseers of those programs. Let's put up specifically what he says. Dianne Feinstein elected me when she asked softball questions in committee hearings, he said. Mike Rogers elected me when he kept these programs secret. He says he's doing the job that you failed to do. Yeah, well, you have to remember, this is somebody who had a troubled employment history, who ran to China and Russia. He stole American classified documents that, because of their release, jeopardizes our troops in the field in places like Afghanistan, and has allowed nation states, Russia, China, and others, to have valuable insight in the way our intelligence services operate to collect information to keep America safe. That's who the messenger is, number one. Number two, the most recent court case, this happened uh, just a few days ago by Judge Pauley, laid out very succinctly the oversight of the NSA program. And I think there's a big confusion about that this is Obama's program uh, that he instituted when he was in office. This is a program that was uh, initiated after 9-11 because we missed a big piece of information. So both of the chairs of these committees, all of the members of these committees, are fully briefed on all of these actions. It is our job to make sure that they comport with the law. We do that, we take that very seriously. I think all of that happened, and I think this most recent judicial ruling is important for one reason. It reinstituted faith in the institution of judicial oversight, congressional oversight, and the uh, checks and balances within the executive uh, branch. I, I, I... Mm, no. So that last part, that's what I was saying, that this uh, recent judicial ruling just uh, it gives Republicans or, and of course there are a lot of Democrats who support NSA spying as well, but those supporters of the whole uh, bulk phone record collection uh, pr uh, program, it gives them, you know, another talking point, and that's one of the things that's disturbing. And of course Mike Rogers pretty much threw all the talking points in there about uh, Edward Snowden. I mean, starting from like the smear about how he had a troubled job history and uh, this would have stopped 9-11. That's I actually made a whole video debunking that uh, a while back. And uh, also, you know, that this is hurting people. And uh, I want to show a couple clips. Uh, first, uh, I want to show Bart, a clip from Barton Gelman also, uh, or this is uh, on Face the Nation, where he was talking about how what Edward Snowden did was he didn't, he easily could have hurt American security a lot more if he'd just taken everything he got and published it himself on the internet or gone to WikiLeaks or whatever, but he didn't do that. He gave it to journalists who were supposed to vet it. And uh, anyway, this is Barton Gelman, who, along with uh, Dave uh, Glenn Greenwald, is uh, one of the uh, journalists who Edward Snowden leaked to. Uh, and here's Barton Gelman explaining how it was much more responsible than just disclosing all the secrets. Uh, anyway, you can see that here. Well, it's clear, Snowden is well aware that the reporters uh, in whom he's entrusted uh, these decisions have held back lots of material in the archives that would disclose particular targets, particular techniques, uh, particular uh, places where certain technologies are used. Uh, that's something have, you've done. And that's something that I've done that he wanted us to do. He asked us not to dump out the documents. If he'd wanted to do that, he would have done it himself. He was more than capable of, of, of doing it that way, posting the whole thing on the Internet. Uh, he wanted us to use our judgment about what was newsworthy, what raised big policy questions for the American people, and what would do uh, too much harm, what would, what would be harmful. And so we consult on every story. The, the NSA, the Director of National Intelligence, knows every detail in every story before we publish it. They have an opportunity to tell us what they think would be especially harmful. Almost always, we accede to those requests. Barton Gelman. 
Yeah, so there you can see Barton Gelman explaining how it is that uh, the leaks from Edward Stone have not really been uh, harmful to U.S. national security, haven't cost lives, and that it's all very responsible and uh, vetted by journalists. And uh, so that's kind of one uh, response to some of the stuff that you hear from the people who attack Edward Snowden. And then uh, another thing I want to show... Uh, People say that if he, you know, really were a whistleblower, he would have stayed and faced charges. And I would show Ben Wiesner again uh, over on Meet the Press talking about uh, some of the problems with uh, trying to stay here and face the charges uh, because of the way that uh, other people have been prosecuted under the Espionage Act. You know, uh, last week uh, I, I was saying how, uh, as a lawyer, uh, you know, hypothetically it would be... Uh, you know, it's interesting to think about trying to defend someone like Edward Snowden because of the justification defense. But uh, looking into that more, I've seen that people who have actually been prosecuted under uh, the Espionage Act, judges have said that they can't even use that defense. They can't even mention being whistleblowers or they can't make an argument about the greater good. And uh, anyway, I want to show uh, this is Ben Wiesner back on Meet the Press talking about that problem here. Circumstances, what are you doing? Here's the problem with that. The, the law under which Mr. Snowden is charged, the 1917 Espionage Act, a World War I era statute, doesn't distinguish between leaks to the press and the public interest. And I think that we can all agree that some of this information has been profoundly in the public interest. Uh, and someone who sells secrets to an enemy for, for personal profit. And in fact, the Department of Justice has argued in legal cases uh, that it's actually worse, a worse violation of the law to leak to the press than it is to sell it to an enemy because all enemies get to see it. Well, well that's true, but the American public also gets to see it. And, and in a democracy, it's very, very important. But he that, took that, an oath not to disclose classified information. That's not right. He took an oath to follow the Constitution. Now, he certainly signed the same standard classification agreement that everybody else signs, but his oath was to the Constitution. Now, if the law allowed him to make a public interest defense, if the law allowed him to come here and say, look at all the good this has done, if the law allowed him to say the government hasn't been able to prove any harm um, from these disclosures, sure, he would face trial in that kind of system. But, but for now, uh, he doesn't believe, and I don't believe, that the cost of his act of conscience should be a life behind bars. How, how often are you in so yeah, I thought that was uh, an interesting explanation of uh, why it is that he's not uh, here facing the charges, and uh, that was something I hadn't really looked into when I was talking about that last week, so I want to show you that clip. Um, and then I want to show uh, one more clip from uh, Ben Wiesner there, also talking about why it is that uh, Edward Snowden deserves amnesty, uh, and uh, I think think he makes an interesting argument I haven't heard a lot uh, and this is like the second to last clip I'm going to show you as you can see it's kind of a, sh a shorter show tonight uh, I'll talk about that a little more but here, here's Ben Wiesner talking about why Edward Snowden deserves amnesty also on Meet the Press here. Any circumstances? He, sure he would come back to the United States he hopes to come back to the United States I mean he would like to have given some deal some amnesty you know Amnesty is not a dirty word. There's a lot of people in this town, including some who have been on your show, who have been given amnesty. We just don't call it that. Uh, lying to Congress is a crime. Uh, torturing prisoners is a very serious crime. Uh, there are lots of times when people violate the law and society decides for one reason or another to look forward rather than backwards. Uh, I think that this is one of those cases. Mr. Snowden's disclosures have been profoundly valuable uh, to the country and to the world. They've really changed the whole debate here. Uh, and I also think that th there, there is much that the United States could gain through conversation with him so uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, what uh, Ben Wiesner said there and uh, I'm really glad the ACLU has become a legal advisor to Edward Snowden and uh, that makes a lot of sense about how giving amnesty wouldn't be much different from what happened with torture and what happened with you know all sorts of things that uh, and I think the the lying to Congress he I think he may have been talking about um, James Clapper who told Congress before all the Edward Snowden leaks said that they weren't collecting all this data or, or weren't collecting uh, data on millions of Americans, which was basically lying to Congress, which is also a crime. So uh, those are all the NSA clips I want to show you. Uh, and I'm almost out of clips uh, and I'm only like, uh, what, about uh, 35 or so minutes into the show. And uh, the, one of the reasons for that is uh, a lot of 
the Sunday shows didn't really have much in the way of newsmakers because it's between Christmas and New Year's and I guess everybody's out of town and you know I showed that one clip from CNN State of the Union where it was this all-female pundit panel talking about all these issues and you know it's kind of their end of the year what were the big stories of 2013 and what are going to be the big story stories coming up in 2014 and the future and uh, as I've said on previous Liberal Viewer Sunday Live clip roundup shows, um, I try not to show the pundits because, you know, I'm making my own commentary and making commentary on the commentary is a little bit too meta or whatever, uh, but uh, occasionally I do it, especially if I see something that's uh, particularly uh, good commentary from some pundit, I will show it. But uh, there weren't a lot of newsmakers this Sunday, and, uh, you know, I showed just one clip from CNN State of the Union with that whole pundit panel. Uh, over on uh, ABC's This Week with George, George Stephanopoulos, uh, they had um, these game changers. Uh, they, they profiled a bunch of people, and they didn't have much in the way of new uh, interview footage. On uh, I mean, for some of them they did. Uh, I thought uh, they did Edward Snowden as one of the game changers, but they had no new uh, interview footage from Edward Snowden. It, the, I think on, the only new footage they used was from... Republican representative uh, Peter King, who's like a huge critic of Edward Snowden, which that seemed a little unfair to me. Um, but anyway, one of the game changers they profiled was uh, Republican Senator Ted Cruz, who was one of the big uh, moving forces behind the government shutdown. And I featured him on several uh, previous Liberal Viewer Sunday live clip roundups. And I just want to show you a, a short clip this, I think this was new interview footage uh, from uh, Jonathan Carl on ABC. Must have talked to Ted Cruz. Anyway, he asked him about how uh, Senator John McCain and some other uh, Republican establishment people had called him and the Tea Party people wacko birds. And uh, I want to show his response here. And I have a, a uh, comment on it that about one of my interests uh, after I showed you uh, for this final clip. If standing for liberty if standing for free market principles in the Constitution makes you a wacko bird, th then I am a very proud wacko bird. A supporter even made a wacko bird hat that Cruz proudly displays in his office. <laughs> now, uh, what I thought was really interesting about that clip is uh, that wacko bird hat. Isn't that a copyright violation? That look, I mean, Disney, that was, or no, uh, no, that was Warner Brothers, wasn't that, uh, um, that wasn't Donald Duck, that was Daffy Duck, but I guess Daffy Duck is the, the wacko bird there, so that's that's a Warner Brothers cartoon. That's a big copyright violation. I'm, I'm shocked to see copyright violations going on in the uh, office of a U.S. Senator, but uh, anyway, so that's the final clip I want to show you from uh, the Sunday shows this morning. Uh, I, get, I had about 15 clips and a couple, uh, I, I, had, I showed you a still there, and but uh, I want to take a quick look here it looks like um, we've got about 80 people is my uh, top number of uh, viewers uh, yeah like right now oh no it looks like over 90 people watching uh, even on this uh, uh, on uh, the sort of holiday off time uh, a lot of people are with their families I guess but uh, I do want to uh, try to get to a, a few of the comments and then, and then I'm gonna have a short show uh, I think I'm gonna go for maybe another five minutes and uh, see what's in the comment section here uh, I'm gonna try to go for some on-topic uh, commentary because uh, uh, I will take comments on any topic when I'm doing my Liberal Viewer First Wednesday Live Q&A. That'll be this Wednesday, January 1st. I always do it at 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time on the first Wednesday of the month, and the first Wednesday of the month uh, in January happens to be January 1st, so I'll be taking questions on any topic, and I'll try to post that like a day beforehand so people can post comments or questions beforehand, especially legal questions. I like to do a little research before the show, and I think my show last uh, month was pretty good because I got to do some legal research, so look for that. Um, but I'm going to see what I've got here. Uh, I see uh, a few off-topic comments, but uh, I don't know what the... 
Yeah, I don't know what that uh, thing is about this word somebody wants me to say, but I will say it if you show up for Liberal Viewer First Wednesday, live Q&A. Uh, but uh, let me see if anyone has anything to say about NSA spying or Obamacare or this whole Benghazi thing. Oh, Pat's Rule 213 says, if you want comedy, watch Fox News. Well, I did show some Fox News comedy. Uh, uh, Pokemon Bank gets delayed thanks Obamacare. I don't know what that's. 280 bucks for one minute. Okay. Well, looks like you're all arguing with each other about some of the Obamacare. Oh, Hans Blick says Benghazi is only not a scandal for Obama fans, even though it wasn't his fault. Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by scandal. Uh, I mean, it was definitely a bad thing that happened, and. Uh, they, uh, there was not enough security, but there was all, I mean, there was this whole like CIA untold story that, that was one of the, some of the clips I didn't show was they were talking about how this, uh, you know, there was an attack on the compound and then also the annex, which was this whole different area. And the annex was the CIA, uh, like air the CIA was supposed to be disarming these militias or like working to disarm these militias that ended up attacking them and anyway it was like this whole intelligence failure so there was definitely bad things and stupid things that the Obama administration and the CIA did in Benghazi but it wasn't a scandal in the way it was played for the 2012 election I'm sorry I'm getting kind of a dry mouth here so I'll do a Marco Rubio, which did show up on one of the Sunday morning shows, but I didn't take that clip. Um, but I just don't think it was a, a political scandal, or it wasn't the scandal the Republicans claimed it was uh, for all that time. So um, it, it, uh, I'm not sure I can agree with what uh, Hans Blitz that said there. Uh, let's see... Um, Seems you're all arguing about how much you owe if you don't get insurance on Obama under Obamacare. It's something like ninety dollars the first year, um, ninety-five. I think it's ninety-five dollars the first year, but it goes up every year. Um, I see you're all arguing about that in the comments section. Uh, uh, Steve Enver says, "Arg, Isa, yeah, and Isa. He didn't. I don't think he did a good job there." Uh, NO8549 says government is still covering up info about JFK assassination as well as 9-11 no doubt ISA well yeah I don't know I, I don't know what to say about and then uh, Hans Blitz says what's this obsession with Al-Qaeda there are many other groups of Mohammedists or Moha yeah of Islamists or whatever yeah that's the thing that I mean that's basically what this New York Times story said is that there are a lot of Islamist groups and sometimes they brag about being affiliated with Al-Qaeda but they're not really connected in any way to the to the core Al-Qaeda group that was founded by Osama bin Laden and is currently run by what is his name Ayman al-Zawahiri um, so uh, yeah that's that's the point of this New York Times article and which you can read for yourself I put a link to it down in the uh, video description below me there so uh, going to take one or two more quick comments here and then I'm going to end the show early because like I said there are fewer clips and uh, I hear some do you hear that Sandy is whining over there I don't know why but she seems to be upset about something so uh, oh scooter Libby anyone no eight five four nine that must be about the whole amnesty thing uh, what uh, Ben Wiesner was saying about uh, how a lot of people get amnesty, we just don't call it amnesty. Well, that was actually a commutation of his sentence, so he didn't have to serve any time, although it didn't give him an actual pardon. Uh, so, oh, and John Klein says, the NSA planted Sandy as a spy in your house. Oh, I, the way we got Sandy was pretty, a, a rescue that was pretty circuitous, and I am not going to start suspecting my dog. I, I, I mean this uh, little camera embedded in my computer now from what I understand the NSA can uh, turn that on at any time even without the little light coming on so that's a little bit creepy I, I think I'm gonna start putting a little piece of tape over my uh, 
camera lens there but uh, anyway it looks like uh, I'm well over 45 minutes and I, I was thinking I'd do about a 45 minute show since I only had about 15 clips this week but uh, like I said I'll be doing this liberal viewer live Q&A uh, where you can ask me anything uh, and I'll try to answer it as best I can that'll be uh, January 1st at 4 30 p.m. Pacific time I'm also working on a video you know I said I was going to try to talk about the the uh, broken Obama promise if you like your health care you can keep it and uh, uh, PolitiFact made that the lie of the year and I've never really understood exactly why that was a lie and so I think I'm going to be making a video in the next couple days that hopefully I'll get up before New Year's Eve that'll be called uh, um, lie of the year when Obama said if you liked your plan you can keep it and uh, I think I'm going to be trying to at least giving my opinion that that wasn't really a lie and in a lot of ways it was actually true even though pretty much everyone in the media doesn't seem to agree with me so you can look for that as well but anyway I appreciate everyone who joined me the uh, looks like uh, at uh, one point here I, I know I was over 90 I'm about 80 now so thank you all for joining me um, for my viewers here in the United States enjoy the rest of your weekend uh, out in Europe and around the world the beginning of your week and uh, happy new year I'll like I said I'll be seeing you on New Year's Day at 4 30 p.m. Pacific if uh, you're interested in joining me for that live Q&A and uh, anyway enjoy the rest of your weekend beginning of your week wherever you are and I guess I'll see you around the internet